In this episode, we move to the beginning of negotiations between the South African government and the ANC. It all started with the release of Nelson Mandela from prison. F.W. de Klerk, uh, in your speech of the 2nd of February, you let the media know that you would be announcing the date of Mandela's release shortly. So for a whole week, the world's media was in Cape Town waiting for this important announcement. Then, on Friday, the 9th of February, you had a meeting with Mandela at Tainhuis. Uh, can you describe that meeting, the meeting in which you told him about his imminent release? Well, by then it was decided that he will be released on the 11th. We had planned to release him in Johannesburg. I had to inform him first before anybody else. And uh, so he was brought to my office again as before. I told him of our plans and he was very upset and he said no. I said, why no? He said, it's too soon. I said, but Mr. Mandela, you've been in jail long enough. It's not negotiable. You must be released now. Let's negotiate about where we want to release you in Johannesburg. And he said, no, it's too soon. But I convinced him in the end. And he said, no, he would like to be released from the Victor Verster prison, where he was living and staying. And he wanted to walk out of there. So we agreed upon Sunday the 11th. And uh, he went back. Uh, I didn't want to give him too much time, because we were worried about what the reaction would be. We wanted it to be short and sweet the release and not to be a whole planned thing with the whole country coming. So uh, we also wanted to keep the media's attention. That's why I didn't announce in my speech on the 2nd of February when it would be released. Well, the, the announcement was then made on the Saturday, the 10th of February. Uh, the, the whole world's media was filled with the news. And the next day, uh, Nelson Mandela, after long delays, walked out of Victor Verster prison together with his wife, Winnie. And he then went to Cape Town, to the Grand Parade, to Cape Town City Hall, and he made a very, very aggressive speech. Uh, very uncompromising. What, what was your reaction to that speech? I was extremely disappointed. It wasn't the Mandela that we've been talking to for months and for years. It wasn't the conciliatory Mandela that I expected. The speech, I think, was written for him by some of the more reactionary types in the ANC. He didn't have time to prepare a speech himself. It wasn't him. But it was disappointing and it was a bad start from my viewpoint to what were to follow. And then following that, there was, a, there was a, a period of three months in which the ANC brought its uh, cadres, its uh, leadership back from exile and prepared for negotiations. And the first actual talks took place on the 3rd of May at your residence, Grutuskir, in Cape Town. Now, this was the first time the government's delegation got together with the ANC's delegation all of these people who had been enemies before. What was the meeting like? Uh, can you recall any of the central points? It was a good meeting. Our point of departure was, let's look at what we agree about. Let's, let's start make, working on a list of things where we are in agreement. And from that emanated a statement after two days, which constituted the foundation for future negotiations. Already then, if I remember correctly, there was mention of a constitutional democracy. And we uh, agreed upon a number of things which we would work together with. Crucial to it was, of course, that further negotiations would follow. And that 
links were established. It was an interesting delegation that he brought. I can't remember all the names, but the three most prominent people talking was Mr. Mandela himself, Tabu Mbeki, and Joe Slovo. Yes. Now, uh, after that, there was another delay while the, different, the various parties gathered their thoughts for negotiations and uh, prepared themselves. But in July uh, 1990, the security forces uncovered an ANC plot, Operation Vula, in terms of which the ANC, despite its now commitment to negotiations, was infiltrating its operatives back into South Africa with a view to establishing underground structures and, and, and uh, putting together arms caches uh, one, under the leadership of people like Mac Maharaj. Uh, this was a shock. What, what was your reaction to this? And how did you reconcile this with the idea of peaceful negotiation? I was, I was very shocked. I had quite a confrontation with Mr. Mandela about it. And it was inconsistent with what was referred to as the Grote Schiermunner. So I took them to task and said, this is impossible, it can't be done. He pleaded sort of innocence, if I remember correctly. And undertook to investigate it. But then at a later stage in public, he congratulated them on the good work they were doing. He was quite inconsistent at times about what he said in public and what he said to me. But uh, it was a bad episode, which to a certain extent helped us to push along towards them, because they haven't done it by then, abandoning and suspending the armed struggle, their armed struggle against the South African government. They then actually, before we met again in Pretoria, suspended it unilaterally. So truly the, the real basis for further negotiations were laid by two things. First, the package which I presented to Parliament and to the country and the world on the 2nd of February. And then by their unilateral suspension of the armed struggle. Those two platforms formed the foundation on which we could build for further negotiations. And the next talks took place uh, in Pretoria in August, I think the 6th of August. And it was at those talks that the ANC formally uh, agreed to suspending the, the armed struggle. And it was also during those talks that, uh, that agreement was reached on how the parties would deal with political offenses. Because a lot of these people coming back into South Africa were still uh, uh, criminals in, 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 in terms of existing law. So special provision had to be made for them. Yes, special provision was made by an act of parliament and agreement was reached that the whole categories of uh, ANC people would be who were in exile and even in South Africa would be released uh, on the basis that their crimes weren't extremely serious crimes. The issue of people guilty of blatant murder and rape and, and uh, gross violations of human rights weren't on the list at that stage. That came later. And then the next meeting uh, took place at DF Milan Airport uh, in February 1991. And it was at that meeting that more details were nailed down relating to uh, the uh, cessation of armed attacks, uh, the stopping of infiltration of men into South Africa by the ANC, uh, the, the stopping of underground military uh, 
structures and what have you. And the, the, the government agreed, on the other hand, to stop its operations against the ANC, to treat the ANC as a normal political party, and uh, then to proceed on this basis with negotiations. But what was the reaction of the security forces to this situation now, that the ANC said that they were not going to uh, use an armed option any longer, and we were then required to stop acting against them? They were definitely shocked by it. They weren't happy with it. Uh, they've been used and be became used to, their task was to fight the ANC. And uh, so it came as a shock to them. But in the end, they uh, said, OK, we accept you, the political leaders. Our task is to create an atmosphere, to help create an atmosphere conducive to good negotiations. And uh, they uh, did not go far in their resistance. Nevertheless, Despite these agreements, violence continued to escalate in South Africa, particularly in KwaZulu-Natal, particularly in the southern uh, Transvaal, as it then was. And with each incident of violence, the, the, there were angry uh, responses from the ANC and a, a more and increasingly bitter tone in Mandela's criticism of you. Somehow it seemed as though the relationship was breaking down. Do you think he was, uh, this was a reflection of his, of his real feelings or was he now beginning to regard you just as a political opponent and for that reason a fair target? I think it was a mixture of both. I think he was fed with information which indicated that I was either looking away or was no longer in control of the armed forces. And I think he believed that to a certain extent, that I might have lost control. But also he regarded me as a political opponent. And he didn't let a chance go by to take a bite at me. So yes, it did influence our relationship negatively. We had some, uh, some very uh, difficult discussions with each other on this. I asked for proof of security force involvement. He never came forth with any proof or evidence. But uh, he continued accusing the security forces of being guilty. Of course, later on, we found out through the Goldstone Commission that, yes, there were elements of the security forces which against my policy were using secret funds to do things which were unacceptable and against my orders. But by the same token, the ANC was uh, conducting a low-level war against other black movements like the EFP to win as much turf as it could before the elections. There's no question that the deaths in KwaZulu-Natal and in southern Transvaal were due to violent conflict between the IFP and the ANC. The ANC wanted to drive the IFP into the ground. I think about 400 top IFP people, leaders, were assassinated in cold blood during that period. So yes, the major cause of the problems was an ANC-IFP issue in KwaZulu-Natal and in parts of the Transvaal. And the security force involvement was much less of a factor. But all of this violence was creating a major obstacle to the commencement of actual constitutional negotiations. And in September 1991, a group of businessmen and uh, religious leaders uh, took the initiative in, uh, in uh, organizing a national peace accord. The government supported this. I think the ANC came along, the other parties came along. And they, the peace accord made provision for a, 
a code of conduct for all uh, parties involved in the process. It made uh, provision for a national peace secretariat that would uh, oversee the peace accord uh, for a national peace committee. And importantly, it made provision for the Goldstone Commission. So that all of these allegations relating to who committed violence, when and by where and so forth, could be properly investigated by an, a neutral and impartial body. Uh, th that was the beginning of the Goldstone Commission. What role did the Goldstone Commission play and, and how, how did you relate to the Commission? Well, let me first say the peace accord and that peace meeting and what flowed from it, the peace committees that localized and so on, made a great contribution towards making things calmer. Uh, it didn't succeed on a ground level to the extent that I had hoped, but where there was good leadership, it worked very well. So I, in retrospect, again lift my hat to the good work that the church leaders and business leaders involved in this, the role that they played in helping to calm things down. Then the second part of your question was about the Goldstone Commission. Yes. The Goldstone Commission played an immensely important role. He was fearless. I gave him every possible assistance that he ever required of me. And irrespective of whom was involved or which side was involved, he was totally independent. He dug deep, he dug to the bone, he uncovered unpalatable facts and he reported on them uh, publicly and to me. He played a very important role and uh, later on he also helped me to uncover unacceptable activities in the uh, security force in environment. Now all of this helped to create a climate in which constitutional talks could begin at CADESA, the Congress for a Democratic South Africa. That, that uh, was convened for the first time at the World Trade Center in Kempton Park, just beside Johannesburg International Airport on the 21st of December. And the basis of CADESA was already distilled in a declaration of intent. The parties had uh, assembled earlier and they had agreed on a vision for the future of South Africa, which included the idea of a constitutional democracy, non-racism, the supremacy of the constitution, the supremacy of the rule of law. Uh, so this was really a framework within which negotiations could take place. How important was that? And to what extent do you think we've achieved or we achieved those goals in the final or the interim constitution? It was very important, that declaration of intent. And what happened at CUDESA 1, the agreements reached at CUDESA 1. It was also the platform on which I launched my vision, which became part of the future constitutional dispensation, namely that there would be an interim constitution. There would be an elected parliament which would do the normal work that parliament does, meaning that uh, it would at the same time act as a constitution writing body, tied to immutable principles which would be agreed upon beforehand, which must be encapsulated in any final constitution. This came as a surprise to the ANC. It was an initiative again from our side. And uh, I think to a certain extent, they were very cross with me for launching that initiative uh, and not negotiating it with them first. And so you would have been fairly happy with the opening of CADESA, with the first uh, <coughs> exchanges that took place. But there were still a few problems that the uh, government had because the ANC was still not abiding by the agreements that had been reached in terms of the Pretoria Minute 
and the DF Milan agreement. Yes, especially regarding regarding security matters. Especially regarding security matters. And so in your last intervention, your closing statement to Gadessa on the 21st of, of December, you made a very strong uh, statement relating to the ANC's failure to do this. You thought that this had been cleared with the ANC in advance, but it hadn't been. And Mandela's reaction was furious. He stood up and he made a statement in which he launched a bitter personal attack against you. What was your, what was your reaction? There were strong pressures even from within cabinet that we should abort Kudesa won because of the failure of the ANC to comply with their undertaking. I realized that to abort Kudesa won would be maybe the end of negotiations. So a compromise was reached. And that is that no, we would not abort it, but I would make a strong statement calling them to order on their failures. I asked Gobi Kutsia, Minister of Justice, to make sure that Mr. Mandela and the ANC gets the message to expect such a strong attack. And that was the softest option I could take. And they must understand it that the other alternative would have been to abort. He assured me that the message was passed on to Mr. Tabu Mbeki. I don't know whether maybe there was a failure of communication and that Mr. Mbeki did not tell Mr. Mandela or that he did tell somebody near to Mr. Mandela who failed to tell Mr. Mandela. So there's a possibility that he, for him, my strong statements, about their failures to comply was a misuse of my opportunity as the last speaker and was uh, a political ploy from my side and that he was genuinely cross. I think that is what actually happened, that he didn't get that message clear enough or that he didn't get it at all. My reaction was, I was extremely upset. The politician in me said, stand up after he spoke and hit back. And I had plenty of ammunition to hit back with. But fortunately, he spoke long enough for me to get some time to, to cool down. And I decided to not to let it develop into a, full-scale public confrontation. I did make a few statements again, but I was calm and collected and sort of uh, tried to push that attack aside and not to let my ego uh, win the battle within me. And it was on that basis that South Africa's historic constitutional negotiations began. In our next episode, we will deal with the crisis that F.W. de Klerk experienced with right-wing victories and by-elections and with the next steps in the CADESA process.